can we go over the top three automated nurturing tools that you have that you found to be consistent for follow for sellers? So, yeah, we could talk about that, Shelly. And so the first thing, obviously, there's a couple of different things that we did where you can go and get these landing pages and you can get them from like $9.99, you know, $9.99 literally. So like I went and bought Brian College Station Home Values dot com and there's these tools. And if uh, Nicole, if you can write a note, I'll send out the exact tools that we use for these home seller leads. So what they do is I would run like some just basic little $10 Facebook ads or whatever. Uh, and then I would send them out at the bottom of different postcards. Like if I had a just listed, I'd have like Brian College Station Home Values dot com at the bottom. So I was doing ads, not many because I don't spend a lot of money on ads. I was spending like 10, 15 bucks. And then um, I would have them in my open houses and I would have them on these postcards. And that's how I drove traffic to like Brian College Station Home Value dot com. So obviously you can just go to GoDaddy, buy the domain. And then there's a widget that you can use that they can plug in their address, plug in their, um, you know, zip code. And then it would spit out just like this basic. Here's what your home is worth. But if you want a professional to truly give you a customized value of what your home is, then, you know, let's schedule, you know, whatever from here. So I was I would do that strategy. And then I would have my CRM with them on a drip campaign. And then there was a way to set them up on a, on a text campaign. So between the CRM, the postcards, and I'll put it all in one strategic approach so it doesn't sound like it's a mosh pit. And then I'll send that out to y'all over the next uh, couple of weeks. Yes, sir. Yeah. Same thing I'm doing with, with KV Core Home Value. And, you know, I do have some leads coming in there. So there you go. Now, the key thing is, remember, I'm always teaching you SSC, right? So what's the strategic intent? What's my system? So my systematic approach and then how consistently am I going to do it? So what you got to do is once you feel like you got the foundation to follow up with the leads and create that nurturing automation, then it's how do I, um, you know, get to a place where I set up enough lead funnel, like enough push to get people to the site. now. So is it, do I put it in my open house signs? Do I, you know, that's the goal. You got to get to a place where you have that in place. All right. Thank you. All right. Number two, what are some major things, signs to recognize in a changing market that will revise your business plan? How do you know when to pivot about and face the market if, if, if the market's ever changing? So I would say, Shelly, I don't know if you made it to our last virtual event. That one's a really good one to kind of double down on because <clears throat> that one's about a shifting market where some of the tools I was going over with the team, a lot of them have never heard because now we're really diving into, you know, price conditions, terms of market. Here's how we need to shift. Here's how we do our value proposition. So I spent a lot of energy. I put about three hours. I think it's three and a half hours of training on a shifting market. So I would go back and like, I'm going to, I think we, I think we should have that one packaged up and ready. So I'll make sure that um, just remind me, we'll, we'll get that out. But as these levels drop, I'm just kind of, you'll see, they'll start ramping up. That's why I'm trying to tell you guys to make sure you're getting all the way through level one and then double back on that shifting market one. All right. Is there anyone currently forming a particular neighborhood? If so, how long What's your market share in that area? So yeah, I've done farming for years. Just remember farming is a 12 to 16 month investment and you don't see any returns or all eyes on that until nine months on average. It's a long game. And if you go back, it's in level one or it's in the beta event where I talked about the four quadrant agents and what you have to have in order to be successful. And farming is you got to have a budget because you're just going to be throwing money and you're not going to be getting a return. And it's like, what the hell is going on? I'm spending two thousand, three thousand, five grand a month and I'm not even getting a call back because it's a long term play. So if you want an immediate response and ROI, farm is not it. I always tell people, when you get to a place where you have a team set up and you're probably, you probably need to be north of 20 million a year to really farm the right way. 
because it's, a, it's, it's expensive and it takes time. So just know that. All right. And then uh, number four, when tapping into the luxury market, do you find it less stressful to work with buyers and sellers? No, it's a different type of stress, right? The buyers are, the buyers and sellers are easier to deal with, but they ask harder questions. But the transaction, the fundamentals of the transaction in the luxury market is still the same. And if you're going to do the work, why not get paid three X more, right? So on a hundred grand, I make three three thousand GCI. On a on a million, I make thirty thousand. So go chase the million. But remember, don't abort your business that you have right now to go chase a million dollar transaction. I see a lot of agents do that too, where they have a really good business at 250, 350, 400, and then they just they can't separate and they go spend all their time chasing million dollar listings. And then they look back and they're like, dang, I aborted the business that I had coming in. So just find a strategic way, which is time blocking, to set aside time every week to start putting towards the million dollar properties. But don't just completely like, if you get me calling you saying I'm ready to buy a 250, don't don't blow me off because I'm not a million dollar deal. So make that transition gradually. It's a gradual tra- transition. And remember, our next virtual event that we're going to do in the next couple of weeks is all about million dollar properties. I'm not talking about anything else other than million dollar listings and million dollar buyers and high, high net worth uh, individuals. So that's the, the whole session will be about that. Thanks all for right? answering the questions, Terrence. Appreciate it. Always. How often at the start of your career, I'm just having to piece it together. Do you sit down with buyers? Give me some, I don't understand what you're asking. Yeah, so basically what I'm asking is that oftentimes I can talk to buyers and they're ready to start looking at listings, but how often do you make sure you sit down, give them an actual breakdown, like presentation, help them understand the process? How often do you sit down with them and do that process? Well, that's why there's a call, there's qualifying questions you need to have on the phone or through email or through text or through FaceTime before you give them your time. I think we as agents just run when we get a buyer and just start showing properties. There's a process. So I go through my qualifying questions before I ever even meet with you. And then I'm deciding if we're, if you're serious or legitimate, because you could just be on there looking at $10 million properties and have no interest in buying and not have the resources. So I'm doing, I'm making sure I'm qualifying. I'm following my gut. I have those qualifying questions that y'all have the list of that I'm not going to go into right now. And then then I get you with three lenders. You get the three lenders. I get a pre-approval letter. Now it's time to get a buyer's rep, IABS buyer's rep, and a, a, a buyer consultation. See, people jump right to the buyer consultation first without qualifying. You got to qualify first to decide if it's worth my time. It's almost like speed dating. I'm going to go on a date with somebody randomly. I never met them, don't know anything about them. You know, you're qualifying them before you show up and give them your time. So that's what you got to look at. So for a new agent, what recommendations do you have to develop our USP? Can you provide an example or discuss how you accomplished this when you first started without any sales under your belt? Yeah, I've talked about this one a couple of times. Tamara, were you at the shifting market training? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, no, I, I just started kind of following you, actually. So, no, I'm kind of okay. new to all of this. Yeah. No, this is good. That's what we're here for. We're going to get you in the game. So USP is just your unique selling proposition. And I break it down and I'll give it to you real quick. You ready? So don't focus. One of the things you never want to say is I'm a new agent. A lot of times agents think that that's going to make them connect with their clients or that's going to give them a little bit of grace. You know, I'm new to this. People don't care. They want what they want. They want their service. So never say that. And then on your USP, you're going to start with the basic things, which is core values. Like, what do you stand for? Like, who are you? What do you stand for? Mine is an acronym, EPIC, E-P-I-G-H, excellence, passion, integrity, growth, and hard work. And when I'm going over my USP, I wind those in there together. And then also, what organization am I a part of? Because I want to use their successes before I have my own. So if I'm a part of TM5 or EXP or XYZ Realty, and we've done this many sales in this area or whatever, And when you break that down, I call it stats, facts, and stories. So you want to have a statistic, you want to have the facts that can't be refuted, and you want to have a story on why your value is apparent to that buyer or seller in that moment. Great. I got it. Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, you're good. And then the last thing you need on your USP is what's your guarantee? Like, I have a guarantee. 
just like I'm telling you guys, you sign up for these courses and you follow my game plan and you just do what I'm telling you to do, you're going north to 10 million easy in sales. So that's my guarantee. If you follow the courses and you execute what we're talking about, you'll see three to five X growth in your business. So if you were talking to a seller, how would you, what would you say your guarantee was, for example? Yes, ma'am. In the listing presentation or something like that. Great question. So what I would say is, I guarantee you five-star service. I guarantee consistent communication. And I guarantee you, we will get the job done. And if at any point in the process, you don't feel that way, I'll make it right. That's literally my quote. And so whatever it takes to make it right, because I'm going to get the job done. And that's my guarantee. Awesome. That's what I needed. Oh, yeah. So when doing... The A by A, any specific examples of what you would say in the first text to your SOI? Oh, okay. You Did you go to my class at, in the EXP world? Yeah, so specifically, go back to the buckets we talked about. It depends on who you're talking to, right? If you're talking to... Spirit, of, it'd be my sphere of influence is who I'm yeah. targeting. Good. So, But even that, you got to break it down. Some people are church members. Some people are cousins. Some people had sons that played on your son's soccer team, right? So it's, uh, it's all kind of like we got to break it down and, and, and put it together. So just make sure you know who's doing what. And that's the key. You see what I'm saying? Like if I'm if I'm specifically talking to parents that our kids played on the same softball team together, then that first text is going to be a little different. And if you don't have their mailing address, at what point would you ask for it? Because at some point in the eight by eight, you're mailing out something. Um, and I know you said it's not complete if you don't have all of their information. Yes, it's not a complete contact unless I have first name, last name, email, cell phone, and mailing address. And at some point in the communication, just and that's a way instead of doing the first text, that's a way to call. Hey, just it's you know, just reaching out, trying to update my database. I'm a real estate agent now. I'm focusing on these areas. This is my, you know, niche. If you know anybody looking to buy or sell, give me a shout. Any suggestions or a specific strategy on determining what your niche? No, as a new agent, you just got to eat what you kill. Buy, sell, new home builder, first time home buyer, you just got to eat what you kill. So you just got to, anything that comes in, you take it. And then when you get a foundation of success, then you can, then you can turn it into a niche. Okay, great. If you're a new agent, you also want to invest. What's your recommendation on doing this simultaneously? I think it's a no brainer. We got to remember, guys, all we do every day is show houses. So why would we not buy them? It's a no brainer. So I think you're on the right track. What I would encourage you to do, if you have the funds to do it now, then go for it. We'll help you in Clubhouse. If you got any specific questions, you can ask me in here every two weeks. But my second level, so I'm literally walking you guys through exactly what I did. I had already been investing in real estate, but then obviously I used my real estate sales business to fund my investment business. So I literally was selling the real estate, making the commissions, taking a percentage to obviously feed my family, a percentage towards my business. And then that other percentage, which we was putting back like 45 percent, that's my account to go take and go invest in real estate. So just come up with those percentages because everybody's like, well, what's the percentage you should I should do? I can't tell you what that is because everybody's expenses and lifestyle is different. But I would say create an investment account where you know this is the down payments that you're going to use to buy real estate. Some people do 60% of their GCI. Some people do 50%. Some people do 25%. But be putting that money away because if you have it all in one account, you're going to spend it. Then you'll never invest. So I would say create that. If y'all haven't read the book Profit First, we're executing that strategy right now. It's a little over the top. Cause it's like seven different accounts. But what I would say is at least do one to two. I mean, I'm sorry, two to three where you're setting aside that money. This is my tax account. Every time I get a commission, I'm going to set aside this much for taxes. I'm going to set aside this much for my family and my business in one account. And then this account is going to be my investment account. I'm going to set that cash aside so I can go invest. All right. And then thoughts on social media, business pages and personal pages. Should I have both? Yeah, I would, but now you can actually, um, I'm trying to like combine my business page and my personal page. Cause now I think once you hit a certain amount of followers, you, they can, you can make your personal page like a, 
like an entrepreneurial page or a business page? Yeah, you can. Um, they'll actually, I know on Facebook, they'll let people start following you outside of your 5,000 friends. You can start gaining more followers and they will monetize your personal page. Um, now, hope that helps. Yeah, we need to do, we need you to do a class on that, sis. All right, let's rock. Yeah, we and need I think that. that's all my questions. The sixth question, I think you kind of answered that already. So, um, yes, ma'am. No, this you. is good. Hey, I'm proud of you. You coming in day one and you getting your value out of it. That's what this is all about. You know, take these courses. The courses, man, level one, the beta event and the billion dollar masterclass that we just did. That's all like, that's just the beginning, y'all. Like, I I ain't even got in my bag yet. So the stuff that we're going to be dropping soon, I'm just trying to get y'all the foundation. And y'all know some of y'all been with me 10 years, eight years. Some of y'all been around me 12 months every day in clubhouse. And every time you show up, I'm still training you on something you never heard about. And like I so I'm saying, I'm like, I'm not even getting into my deep concepts yet. Laura says, do you have any podcast YouTube recommendations for getting better at public speaking? I need to be more present on video making reels, but struggle to overcome the feeling of feeling awkward in front of a camera. And what to talk about. So, all right, Laura, you ready? Yes, sir. First off, be you. Everybody else is already taken. You've heard me say that a million times. So be yourself. Next thing is find things that I'm doing it right now. Like find things that you're that like you're naturally inclined to talk about. Right. And whether it's hobbies, whether it's a certain type of property, let's say you love modern form houses then double down on that. Or let's say you love luxury properties, double down on that. Let's say you're really passionate about ranch sales, double down on that, but find something that's natural. I think where we go wrong is we see other people posting and doing and then we say, well, man, I should be talking about high rise condos. Hell no. We're in College Station. We don't have high rise condos. Right. So I think start there. The next thing I would tell you is over the next six months, every day, I want you to journal for 15 minutes. And I want you to journal the questions that you're answering from your clients. So every day there's people asking questions about this home or this this evaluation or this financing. And then start putting them, putting them into five categories, five categories. And then you're going to look up and you're going to say, damn, after six months, there's a thematic approach in, in the way that I can organize this. And then literally you start doing your videos on answering those questions. Hey, guys, people keep asking me when you're buying a new builder home, what are the top 10 things that we need to be on the lookout for? Let me go over. And then that's your content. You don't have to worry about being awkward. You're answering those questions every day anyway. And then that's the content. So like they say, don't try to make the content, be the content. And then the last couple of things is there's three ways that you're going to get people to keep in tip, like follow up with you as a real estate agent on social media. One, you're entertaining them. So you're posting videos, you're dancing, you're jumping off buildings, whatever entertains them that they can just click on your page and mindlessly watch it and be entertained. We all know that's not my approach. I'm not, a, you know, I'm good. I don't want to do all that. All right, cool. So then what's the next one? informational, right? Can I get on your page and learn, like truly learn on how to invest in my first property, whatever. And then the third one is inspiring them so that you show your success, you inspire them, but then you turn around and give them the tools they need in order to achieve what you achieved. And that's where, that's why we are all in the room. There's 22 of us in the room or 20 people in the room. Because you guys have seen what I've done, you're inspired by it, and now I'm giving you the tools to go achieve exactly what I've done. When I tell you guys literally in my courses and with the beta event, I'm not holding anything back. I'm not like, oh, I'm going to give them this, but I'm not going to give them that. I'm truly giving y'all everything I know as I build these courses out. And that's the three ways that you grow a following and get business and have people that respect what you do. That's it. Cool. Awesome. The Thank you. Yeah, the journaling way is the way to go and then put it in five Put it in first time home buyers. I love first time home buyers. I love investors and create some type of approach and organize it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like that idea a lot. I never thought about doing that. So I'll start working on that. So what's the next step to execute? Put it on your time block. There we go. All right. All right, Teresa, you up. Okay, what does trade value mean with investment properties? Run that by me one more time. So in um, your course, you mentioned trade value with investment properties. So I wasn't sure what exactly that meant. Yes, ma'am. So there's a, the there's a trade. Was. Yeah, there's, 
Yeah, that's a good question. So trade value means a lot of different things in different spaces. So if you're in a commercial space, so let's say investment properties for commercial, then you look at cap rate. So you need to study how to calculate a cap rate. You take the NOI and you divide it by a sales price, that gives you the cap rate. Cap rate just gives you at that point in time for that property, a rate of return. ROI. Okay. And then think about it. If you look at a Starbucks, right, and it's trading at a five cap, you take the NOI, you do it times the sales price. That's how you get the rate. So that's just telling me if I pay cash for that Starbucks, that's the that's the rate of return I'm going to make on my money. So let's say if it's at a five cap and I pay cash, I'm going to make five percent. So that's that's the whole trade value. Now, you also can look at on the multifamily. It's called a per door. So if you want to keep up with what multifamily is selling for. Then you look at, okay, is it trading at $225,000 a door or is it trading at $175,000 a door? So that's just a quick way to know, okay, does this make money at the door rate? Because if you look at a multifamily deal and it's at a half a million dollars a door, good luck trying to get that to cash flow. And then on just basic properties like a $100,000 house, the trade value is, okay, is it, what's the gross rent multiple? So there's so many different ways. So that's why I tell you guys, as you're getting into these higher level spaces, which I'm going to be walking y'all through, we're just doing the basic buying and selling now. Soon we're going to be talking about how to take down $50 million apartment complexes, how to develop neighborhoods, all that. It's all coming. But that's why we're just getting the foundation. But the other way you want to figure out is um, what's the, like if you get in the hotel, which I'm not going to dive into this, is a thing called Rev Park. And that's a whole nother conversation. So just focus on what niche that you're doubling down on. If it's in houses or investments, then you can do that one easily. Because we know it's the, it's the, it's the 1x multiplier. If I spend a million dollars for something, I need to be bringing in what per month to make sure it at least cash flows. Anybody know? 100,000. 10,000 a month. 10,000 a month. Oh, 10,000. Dang it. Percentages. No. Yep. So 10,000 a month. So obviously if I spend a hundred grand on an investment property, I need to be bringing in my note. 1,000. 1,000 a month. So we know if we're looking at a deal and we got somebody trying to sell an investment, a duplex for a half a million, and they're only bringing in a thousand aside, that's not going to cash flow. That's going to be a hard sell. So if you price that property well over the market like that, you better be in an appreciating market or you're going to have a stale property that you're wasting time and energy and money on. So my next one is, is there a book I can read to help with open-ended questions or asking stronger questions? So get that book. They ask, you answer. They that was ask, actually on our books, on our, on our list. We read that one, actually. That was on our list. Well, and that's where y'all are probably wondering, why is Murph like, every, y'all got to know that anything that I do, has a, has a, it's tied to something. I don't do anything for a waste of time. Not one conversation, not one moment in life. I've never been there. I've always been intentional. So just know, like, those little books that I'm weaving in there, it's all tied to everything we're doing to build this thing together, man. Like, I want everybody to eat. We are truly building the craziest, strongest organization in the world and at EXP. I'm telling y'all, we're not playing games. Wait till y'all see the announcements. This week. There's two brokers that's joining in Houston in the next 10 days. They're both bringing over 100 agents. Like, we're not playing games right now. So we're coming with it. So yeah, get that book though. That's that's the, that's what you want to you want to get your hands on. Where can I find who the agents are that work for the builders? That's easy. So go in MLS, go to type, put in new builder home. It's gonna pull all active builder homes in our MLS, and then do sold uh, times uh, three sixty five, and then run a quick report. And you can see who all the listing agents and buyer agents that work with builders. And so just to piggy off back that, because I do want to target new builds or um, builders, I can just go to like Facebook and Google what the, the agent's doing and how I can stand out more than them. Just track them, right? So just start looking up new builder homes and then start tracking their Facebook, start tracking their website. Look at, the, I used to know everybody's website in the market. I knew every agent by name. I knew their statistics. I knew what builders they had. I knew what their websites looked like. So I just went and created the number one website in, in town when I used to code it all myself. All we got to do is just double down and execute, double down and execute. That's why I'm, my sense of urgency is really high and it's going to be high going forward. 
Because, man, when you got a window, like you're right now, you're so focused on new building homes, you got to double down on that and go execute because you got to build out that pipeline. And when building a business, do I need a business name right away? What's the pros and cons of using a business broker? Is it in my favor? No, you don't need a business broker. You are the business broker. So if you want to go form an LLC so you can start running your commissions through that, maybe look at that option. But other than that, that's all you need. Um, what can I do to find farm and ranch properties that are off market deals? Is there anything else I can do besides reading the contract to become competent in farm and ranch? If you want to do farm and ranch, remember any niche you're going into, there's a wall standing in front of you. And if you're going to break it down, you got to do more and over and beyond the call of duty. I was listening to a quote from Tiger Woods and he was talking about, he said, listen, if you, if you don't work extra hard, but do more than everybody you're competing against, he said, don't expect success at a high level. He said, but honestly, you don't deserve it. And man, that really like that, like hit me in my like core. So it's like, if there's already people that are doing former ranch, if you're not willing to do 10 times more than what they're doing right now, not only can you not expect to get their business, you don't deserve it. So if you're going to remember, anytime we get a real estate transaction, guys, we got to remember this business is warfare. I'm the general with the flag. I'm running up the hill right now. And this is a good analogy. I literally got the flag and I'm blazing forward. No one is in front of me because I'm the one running out in front. So all I see is the hill and we're trying to take it. Y'all are running with me, beside me, shoulder to shoulder and behind me. I don't have the time to look behind and see if y'all are still running. I'm just trying to take the hill. Because if we stand still, we're going to get picked off. And that's where I'm trying to give y'all everything I can give you because you got to keep up with me. If at one point y'all are keeping up, I'm going to take the hill myself. But I'm taking the hill. So it's like, who's coming with me? And how fast can you run and keep up with what I'm telling you and execute? And just remember, anytime business is warfare, anytime you get a transaction, you took that from somebody else. Because especially if it's a seller, Think about it like this. I bought if If you didn't sell me the property, that means I bought it with somebody else. That means I'm choosing you over my previous agent. Man, when I really understood that concept as a new agent, man, I took my business so fucking serious. And I still do. Now, I've backed off. I'm a lot calmer than I used to be. I have no clue. But that's a lot of responsibility. This family's choosing me over their previous agent who's still in the market. So that means they're going to burn that bridge because as soon as I put their house on the market, you know that agent's going to call them. I saw you went with Terrence. Is there anything I could have did? So now they got that pressure. They probably got family members that are agents. So they're choosing to give me that property. I got to take on the responsibility to get the job done. So just know that if you're going to break down the wall of former ranch or new builder, that builder is going to have to fire somebody. Well, I've been listening with this agent for 10 years, but you know, they have gotten a little lazy. I'll give you a chance. But what you think that agent's going to do as soon as they give you the list? Go call that builder. Now they got put under the pressure of, here's why I went with Teresa. So now you got to perform. Just be chewing on, okay, SSC, go back and ask yourself the five questions under each letter and then go pursue. But you can't do both at once. You got to pick one and choose. It's tough to roll out new pipelines at the same time. Yeah, right, I agree. I'm, I'm trying to find my niche right now, so. Yep. So just go, but double down on it. You can't do it for two weeks and get a return. You got to do it for 90 to 120 days. Don't turn back after a month. You're already, you're already running up the hill now. You can't turn back. Like that other agent already knows you called her builder. So you might as well keep going. You see what I'm saying? So go take the hill. All right, y'all, let's open up for q and If you didn't submit, we got a couple more minutes to ask any open-ended questions. Let's get it. I'm investing in my first uh, investment property right now. And so I am literally running down the hill looking for uh, properties and I'm following the real estate entrepreneur podcast suggestions, how many I had to look at, you know, in order to entertain them and uh, submit offers. But my question was when you were buying your first investment property, like what was going through your mind and is there anything you would change or have changed in the process since your first acquisition? Ask me that again, V. Give me a little more clarity on it. Just okay. more precise. So I know I'm I'm looking at cash flow and I'm looking at, you know, all of these things. And right now it seems like everything that I'm looking at to invest in right now, um, the cash flow is really tiny, right? <laughs> you know, it's really small um, on a lot of these. And I guess it's to be expected, especially with interest rates and everything. But when you bought your first investment, I know it was very different times, but kind of 
when you saw your cash flow, what was going through your mind and what were some acquisition strategies maybe you might have used then that are different from today? Purchase your home letters has worked really well for me. Go back in a uh, workplace member. Laura put up all the letters or somebody put them up in the, under the files. Use those purchase your home letters and door hangers. Those have worked really well for me because okay. uh, I found an area that I like. And then you got to be really strategic on how you're just follow my purchase your home letter strategy. It'll get you the buyers. I mean, it'll get you the, the listing opportunities to either buy yourself or take it to market. The other thing I would say, V, is you got to decide what works for you. Is it, if I'm going to invest in this property, I need $500 a month in cash flow over and beyond, right? That's an extra six grand a year in cash flow. But I, one of the things we don't calculate is phantom income, which is I've created a calculator I'm already working on a billion dollar real estate investor course because I, as these ideas come up, but I created a custom calculator for y'all that I'm going to give y'all on that course where you can literally plug in the sales price, the rental income, the taxes, the insurance, and then it's going to spit you out a number. And that's where internal rate of returns come. People only fo focus on ROI and cash flow. But remember, let's say I have 10 properties all at a thousand, let's say 2000 a month. But a thousand is going towards my principal, right? Well, if I'm at 10 properties at a thousand, that's ten thousand dollars a month that's paying down my note. But that's phantom, it's called phantom income. And here's why. If somebody else is paying down your debt, that's like them giving you the money to pay it yourself. The only difference is the reason why it's called phantom income, because you don't get taxed on it. This is why the rich get richer. This is why the wealthy get wealthier, because they know how to play the money game. And that's what I'm trying to teach you guys. We're going to get this sales thing knocked out five levels. Then we're diving into the billion dollar investor. And I'm going to show y'all how to build these balance sheets and all be multimillionaires. It's not complicated. Just follow them. And then just stick to the strategy. And then you got to be willing to take the risk. That's the other thing. Like, it's going to be some times where you're going to get a little squeezy in the stomach. But that's a part of it. No risk, no reward. And you're going to win some and you're going to lose some. But to answer your question, V, I would focus on a niche. And then are you going to be a burr strategy type person? Are you going to be a value add? Are you trying to buy a little bit newer? So, Because remember, it's sweat equity versus check. If you buy something that's a little more newer and turnkey, it's not going to cash flow as much. But if you're buying something that needs some fixer upper, needs some work, it better have some cash flow. Or after my ARV, right, I'm not going to sell it. But after I put the money into it, I need to be able to go lease it for a lot more. Yeah, Burr was my first strategy. And then Flip is a secondary strategy I was thinking about. But I was, you know, kind of I was looking at those taxes. And then um, the other yeah. one was. Let me talk about that real, real quick. Okay. Take Flip out of your game plan. Most people flipping, they're, they're pretty much just like realtors almost, right? They're, because here's what they do. They buy the house, they fix it up, they flip it. You're paying capital gains on that. So depending on whatever tax bracket you're in, you're getting hit over the head. Versus let me have the same house that you were going to flip. And you see people posting. I made 40 grand. I made 60 grand, right? And they're bragging about the flip strategy. You give me that same house. Let me buy it. Put money into it just like you did as the flipper. Except I'm going to rent it for, for 12 months. And then after 12 months, I'm going to refi and take out the same 50 grand you made tax tax free. So you made 50 grand on your flip after all your expenses, title policy, commissions, whatever. I made the same 50 grand, but I refinanced it. I paid some refinance fees, but I got the 50 grand tax free. I paid no capital gains on that 50K. Good. And then let me ask you one last thing. Are you opposed to owner financing? Is that too risky? I don't mind owner financing as long as the terms are within market. A lot of times with owner financing, they try to hit you with a 12% or the paperwork has a balloon in there. Well, remember, guys, how you remember a balloon? If you touch a balloon with a pen, what happens? It pops. But I'm saying that's on the reverse, me being the person that's the owner who's financing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My bad. I'm sorry. So you buy the house and you're on the financing. Yeah. But, but why? Like, I don't okay. want to accept it. I want to own ownership. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to buy it, fix it up, and then own the finances to Terrence and Erica. So in three to four years, they own it. No, I want to own it. You can pay me rent. Okay. 
Yeah. So you guys, that's where fixing, flipping, burr, owner financing, what builds long-term equity and long-term wealth ownership. And this is a true statement. If you can buy real estate and hold it for seven to 10 years, 10 years for sure, it doesn't matter what happens in the market. You're going to make money. So just to follow your strategy and make it really uh, solid, I've got a game plan. So now I'm going to go ahead and purchase that property and we'll go ahead and fix it up. And then we're going to refinance it. Then we're going to rent it out basically. And then we're going to pull the equity with no taxes and do it again. Correct. Now here's the thing, V. There's a couple of things you got to make sure. Make sure you say it in order. You know, I'm very particular. Mm -hmm. So you're going to fix it up. You're going to rent it first. You can't refinance it until you rent it. Rent it. Okay. And you need to rent it. For at least 12 to 16 months, 18 months, it just depends. You got to check with your banker and the terms that you have. Okay. Then once you built up some equity in your note through appreciation and debt pay down. Refi. Then that's where you can refi that equity, get it out, and then go do it again. Okay, perfect. Thank yes, you. Ma'am. Oh, yeah. Quick question, Terrence, before we go. Are you? Do you um, purchase or know anyone that purchased scatter lot? It depends um, what the play is. Right. Like I, I buy them for sure. I would say right now people are looking for density. So like if you say, hey, I got 28 lots or I got 16 lots that we can piece together all within a two mile radius. So I would try to get a strategy together like that from a Mm -hmm. marketing standpoint. Hey, I got 10 lots between these four blocks. When you do it that way, you're not only be able to sell them, you'll be able to sell them in a package. Right. Do you purchase? Because we all, I have something off market. It's like maybe like 50 something lots that yeah, she's trying to get of. Let's get it. Okay. I'll yes, send you an email. Yes, ma'am. Put me on your list. I'll look at it. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Hey, Murphy, I did have one question. A pair of duplexes. He's like, I'll let them go for 800000 It's a well, mile within Texas a and but he's open to hear what other what other suggestions he have if he was to sell it. But his price is a little bit higher. How would you navigate that conversation? Well, go find him something to buy first, and then that's how you leverage the sale. That boy was looking for something, <laughs> looking for something scientific. <laughs> <laughs> it's it took me to find him, but like, okay, I got you. Yeah, bro, go find him something to buy. Then that's the flip opportunity. Like, hey man. You said you wanted me to find you something that can make sense. I got these packages of this. Now let's sell that. And then on his side, to try to get the evaluation, figure out if there's a development play, right? If he's sitting on a 10,000 square foot lot or an 18,000 square foot lot, go to the city and figure out what the development opportunities is. If the property's older, can be torn down. Because the dirt around the one mile radius is the money. People were, people were giving me a hard time when I was 25 years old, 20, uh, 24 Buying stuff around campus. Why are you buying that shit? That don't make sense. Okay. I made millions off buying that stuff around campus. All right, y'all. I got to run. Love y'all. See you soon.